welcome to Calibrated, a webcast about uncertainty, Bayesian inference, and machine learning. I'm your host, Eric Novik, and I'm uh, uh, very excited to have Uri Shalit from Technion University in Israel joining us today. Uh, welcome to the program, Uri. Hi, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and happy to be here. Excellent. Uh, by the way, background, so you're currently an assistant professor at Technion, but I, I noticed your bachelor's degree was in math and history. My guess is that was not a very common double ma double major. So what, why math and history? Just, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. Uh, even though I was quite grown up when I started, I was 24 when I started my bachelor's. But both seemed interesting. I, I had no idea what's machine learning or AI back then. And I figured I'll do what's interesting and math will be a reasonable choice if things go, go south. Uh, <laughs> Okay. And, and it, it so math was well. a hedge. Yeah. I mean, I liked math, but it was a hedge. Uh, okay. So something went wrong, right? So you had to stick with uh, I ended History up wasn't not, as not being an historian. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, we're going to fast forward a little. So your, your PhD was in computational neuroscience uh, at the Hebrew University, which sounds a bit more narrow than machine learning. And so what, what problems did you end up working on? Uh, during that program? So I started working on problems which were about how do brains compute motor commands, like how do you control the hand with the neural codes, like with measurements of real neurons. And that was, I thought that was really interesting to study, but not to research. Like I enjoyed the talks and the papers, but I didn't really enjoy the work. And then I kind of got exposed to machine learning during that work and that completely took over my, my entire attention. And I just switched to working on machine learning within the, that, that program was flexible enough to allow me to just work on machine learning, uh, which I discovered was what I really wanted to do. Great. And uh, how did you end up working on uh, causal inference and in particularly that that's another source of specialty and particularly causal inference yeah. in, in healthcare? So I, I decided I wanted to work in, in healthcare in general. Uh, after my PhD. So my PhD was more on the optimization side. And then I went to, I, I spent a few months at IBM has a machine learning for healthcare group in Israel. And they're like, there's this thing called causality, which seems relevant to healthcare. And that's where I first learned about it and it seemed just a very natural subject. To me, it was obvious that if I'm going to machine learning in healthcare, I want to learn how to treat people. It was just obvious to me that's what you do. It, since then, I've learned there's much more that you could do. But if you want to treat people, it turns out you need to understand causality. So that, that's how I got into that. Hmm. Interesting. And then do you, you, did you continue working on that? Because uh, you were a postdoc at, at NYU for a while. And did you continue working on, on uh, causal inference in, in healthcare there as well? Yeah, so I went to NYU working with in David Sontag's group. He was back at NYU then, now he's at MIT. And David was also interested in, in getting into causality for, for the same reasons, that it's so relevant for healthcare. So it was deeper and also had the privilege to work with Jennifer Hill there. She's a causality, well-known person in causality, so I learned a lot from her and worked with both of them, actually, during my postdoc. Gotcha. Okay, and, and uh, the last thing I'll ask before we turn it over to you is sort of to set maybe a little bit of a meta context for what you're going to talk about. So you, you're talking about a problem learning these conditional average treatment effects. Uh, how, how did this just re research came about? Coming from machine learning, we basically, it's a bit of a, the classic machine learning uh, kind of work is not very careful. It's more like, let's do things, let's get the best numbers, you know, let's win the competitions. That's the culture. Of course, I'm generalizing. And then I got hit from all directions, from people from causality and from statistics who are much more careful because they have to be much more careful. And I was kind of taking in all their all this criticism that says, no, if you want to do something which is safety critical, you have to be much more careful. And eventually... I, I became that person who's much more careful and who's scolding everyone else for not being careful enough. And specifically want to, to learn about how to treat patients individually, thinking about how all the ways in which this could, could go wrong, not all the ways, but many of the ways in which this could go wrong. And that's what got me into thinking about uncertainty, all, all kinds of types of uncertainty. It also led me to collaborate with the people I'm working, like I, the papers I'll present here are with people from Oxford University who kind of specialize in thinking about uncertainty in machine learning. 
irrespective of causality and kind of brought together our two fields of expertise. Excellent. Okay, so let's turn it over to you now for everyone else. If you have questions for Ori, please, please uh, uh, as before, just uh, type it into the chat window. We typically don't, uh, wouldn't interrupt Ori, but he may ask for some feedback at the end of a section or something, and at that point, we may chime in. We'll leave most of the, uh, the other questions for Q&A uh, later on. So uh, without further ado, Ori, take it away. Thank you. Responsible patient level causal inference, taking uncertainty seriously. And like I said, this is joint work uh, with three great people from Oxford, Andrew Jessen, Soren Linderman, and Yurin Ka. Um, so using patient data to personalize treatment, uh, at least in my mind, is one of the ultimate promises in big data and health. And it's especially important when there are no clear clinical guidelines, which is often uh, enough the case. Uh, it's not uh, obvious how to treat uh, complex patients and have many examples if anyone's interested in that. So as we all know, we have so much more data, especially health, like including health data than we had in the past. And in general, machine learning is a field that shines when there's lots of data. You could do all kinds of fancy things. However, most healthcare data that we have is observational. It's collected routinely in hospitals and clinics uh, by the patients themselves uh, and not in a, a controlled trial setting. And if we really want to use all this data to treat, to learn how to treat patients, we have to take into account this observational data, uh, nature of the data, and think about this as a causal question. So we have to use the ideas and tools of causal inference, we have to think about confounding, as we'll see now. Talk about four parts, introduction, then I'll talk about modeling statistical uncertainty, modeling causal uncertainty, and if we have time, we'll talk about the experiments. What's the, the setup, the causal setup of the problem? Let's say we have a patient, uh, Anna, and you have this big feature vector uh, X for Anna. Let's say she has high blood sugar. We're debating between two treatments. So this entire talk will be only on the setting where we're debating between two possible treatments. It can generalize to more, but we'll focus on the binary case. So we have medication A and B, or T equals zero, T equals one, T is for treatment. And we can imagine Anna has two possible futures under each of these possible treatments. So for treatment T equals zero, she will have some level of blood sugar, hopefully lower. And for T equals one, one, she'll have maybe a different level of blood sugar. And we denote these two potential outcomes as Y0 and Y1. These are two, the two possible futures for this patient Anna under the two possible treatments. And these uh, Y0, Y1, it's a very common notation. These are the potential outcomes, the Rubin name and potential outcomes, uh, which are kind of the basis of a lot of work in causal inference. Now, the quantity of interest for us uh, throughout this talk will be the Kate, the conditional average treatment. So this is the expectation of Y1 minus Y0 condition on X. X is a feature vector we think about as maybe Anna's medical record, her entire medical history. And we want to know whether her blood sugar will be higher under treatment zero or one, and this quantity uh, will tell us, again, condition on at least X, which is what we, the measurements we have for N. Now note that while Kate is the quantity of interest, we never directly observe it in our data, in any data. For every patient, we either see Y1 because they receive T equals one, or we see Y0 because they receive T equals zero. Maybe the patient switched medications a year later, but a year has passed, and that means it's not really the same patient their X has changed. So really we only see either Y0 or Y1. This is known as the fundamental problem of causal. And in most cases, if we have, if our data comes from clinics or from hospitals, the choice, which of the two potential outcomes we get to see for each patient is not random because physicians don't prescribe medication randomly. And the choice it might be driven by unobserved factors, not just observed factors. All of these things make estimating Kate a bit of a challenge. This is the notation because we can, this is an expectation, so we can uh, decompose it into a difference of two conditional ex expectations, expectation of Y1 condition on X and of Y0 condition on X. And think that one way to think about it is what if we forced the, the quantity, what it expresses is, what if we forced patients with features X to receive treatment T equals one versus what would happen if we forced them to receive treatment T equals zero. And force here is important because it means irrespective of what physicians actually do, and what's actual practice. We want to say we force them to receive T equals one, then we imagine this other world where we force them to T equals zero and we compare the two and know, and that the, if we knew the answer that would tell us what is better 
for patients with features X. And in our work, X will be high dimensional and essentially unique for each unit, let's say for each patient. And like we said, we never directly observe it. There are many ways to estimate K. You could use basically standard regression or machine learning tools with all kinds of tweaks in its entire domain, which I will not go into, but you can use these under a strict set of causal identification assumptions. So I'll give now a set of assumptions. If these assumptions hold, then you have this whole slew of tools that you can use uh, to estimate Kate. But these assumptions are where the problem often lies. So the first is that there are no hidden confounders. And we'll go into these uh, in detail. The second is overlap or common support, sometimes called positivity, which means that the two, the, the population of patients that receive t equals zero and t equals one are more or less similar. Not the same, but they have overlap. Third assumption, which we'll not go into, that there's no interference between units, is the treatment for one unit does not affect the outcome for another unit. Uh, this assumption it holds if we're treating, let's say, diabetics, maybe, but not if we're thinking about, for example, about vaccinations, where my vaccination might affect my uh, neighbor's status. Now, most of these assumptions are not testable from data, uh, which makes them uh, challenging. And we'll get back to these soon. We have this quantity Kate. I just want to set up how I think, how do I imagine using it? And we're actually working towards using this in practice. Let's say we have some estimator Kate hat of X for an incoming patient with features X. Uh, we can use this estimate to recommend to a doctor how to treat this patient. Let's say if we think, it, let's say higher is better. If Kate, if Kate hat is positive, we will recommend t equals one. If Kate hat for X is negative, we'll recommend t equals zero. And the doctor still, of course, makes the choice themselves. We're only recommending three. This is kind of the way we, we imagine using Kate hat in practice. And again, this is not just imagining, we're working towards actually uh, making this real. But we have to acknowledge that even though it's just a recommendation, it's a high stakes, stakes recommendation. Like uh, we, we might influence uh, treatment. We have to be uh, cautious. And there's this uh, dictum from, from medical school, uh, primum non nocere or nocere, uh, first do no harm, right? We want to do no harm. And we want to think about the algorithmic version of it. Are we really sure about our estimator? Did we do our, our work, like, uh, did we do it well? If we're sure about our estimate, uh, then sure, we can recommend. But if we're uncertain about k hat x for particular x, we might not decide not to recommend. We might say, let's defer the decision. We'll say, we have no recommendation. We're not sure about our k hat. We're sorry. We can't help you here because if we, we're, we, we worry you might do harm by making an unsound recommendation. And a lot of what I'll talk about today will be about this decision to defer. Like when are we sure and when are we not sure about our Kate hat estimates? How do we make sure our recommendations are safe? We want to identify sources of uncertainty. And I'll outline now a few sources of uncertainty for this individual level causal inference for Kate X for high dimensional. So one reason we might be uncertain about our Kate hat X estimate is that we have lack of similar samples. So we have this new patient, and they're, they're not really like most of any of the patients we've seen when we fit our models. We only have finite sets. This problem could be worse if the tests and train sets are drawn from dis different distributions. So I might have fit my model on data from Israeli patients, but now I'm deploying it in the US. The distribution is different, so this might, uh, might pose a problem. It's known as covariate shift or domain shift in machine learning. Another problem is lack of overlap. So we had this overlap assumption, the assumption that the population uh, receiving t equals one and zero is the same, but this assumption might be violated. There might be no common support. For example, maybe patients over 80 only receive t equals one. Maybe there's a reason they don't receive t equals zero. But that means that for patients over 80, I have no way to estimate their outcome under t equals zero. And assuming age is important, that means that I can, there's, there's no way I could estimate Kate for patients over 80 because I've never seen, the, seen them receive T equals zero. So I should be very uncertain about their Kate. Finally, we might have lack of context or a hidden confounding, which would be a source of uncertainty. Okay, we might have unmeasured factors that influence both the treatment assignment and the outcome. Okay, these are the unmeasured confounders, the hidden confounders. And it is well known that if we have hidden confounders, if we have factors unmeasured, which influence the treatment decision in our data and the outcome, 
we will we might have a biased estimate. So here's an example. Let's say that patients who receive some treatment tend to have better support at home. They're hospitalized, but the physicians know they have better support at home. And that's the reason they can tolerate T equals one. Maybe that treatment requires a more a, a difficult follow-up at home. This fact might not be in the medical record. The medical record might not designate if they have what level of support they have at home. But better support at home here not only determines the treatment, but it might determine the outcome regardless of the treatment, right? People who have better support might have better outcomes, not because of the treatment, just because of the better support. So this might be an example of a hidden confounder if it's not recorded in our data set. And that might lead to uh, uncertainty in our estimate or might lead to, to, to mistakes. So just to formalize the, the last two, lack of overlap. Uh, so sorry, the, 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 the statement of overlap requires that probability of T condition on X is always positive. That might be violated. Hidden confounding in the potential outcomes notation is denoted as Y1 and Y0 are both independent of T condition on X. And again, this conditional independence statement might be violated in the case of hidden confounding. And we want to deal with uncertainties re relating uh, to all three of these and possible violations of these statements. Assuming we have a way to estimate all these uncertainties, we might end up with these intervals. And we might uh, say that if our uncertainty interval covers zero, we will defer accommodation because we don't know if the k is positive or negative. If, it's not, if we're not sure if it's positive or negative, we're not sure which treatment is better. Uh, another way to defer is just to say, oh, if the uncertainty is very wide, that means the model has no idea. If, if, like, if it covers a, a huge range of uh, possible outcomes, we might say, okay, we, we're no good here. Uh, let's not make a decision. Let's not make a recommendation and defer. Okay, so this is the general framework. Now we'll talk about the first part of these uncertainties, what we call statistical uncertainty. Some people might dispute the use of the term uh, here. Just, uh, I'm happy to hear such disputes uh, later. And this basically, uh, this part of, of the uncertainty modeling was described in our NERVS paper from last year. The statistical part of the uncertainty is due to finite samples, covariate shift, which is like changes in the distribution between the training and test, and violations and near violations of the overlap. Everything except hidden confounding, basically. And we will use one method to account for all of these statistical uncertainties jointly uh, under the term epistemic uncertainty. Here's the way we, we model it. We assume we have a data set, an observational data set of patients with measured covariates X. We know the treatment they received T. And again, the treatment was decided by the doctor, by the physician, and was given to them. And their outcome Y, which corresponds to either Y0 or Y1, depending on which treatment they received. And we will model the outcome distribution as P of Y condition on X and T and omega. Omega would be the model parameter. So this is a Bayesian approach. And we'll assume that omega is a set of weights of a neural network. Is it, sorry, is a distribution over the weights of a neural network. This is the way we model it. And this is falls within the regime of what's called Bayesian neural network. We make this assumption. Now, how do we actually model K? So K is, as we said, could be thought about, oh wait, I should be conditional on X here. This is a typo. So K is the expectation of Y1 minus Y0 conditional on X, which is the expectation of Y1 conditional on X minus the expectation of Y0 conditional on X. We will simply model these two conditional distributions with two uh, functions, mu omega one of X and mu omega zero of X. Uh, and just the difference. And these both these two mu's we'll think about as neural nets with a distribution over the weights over the parameters of the neural net. And this framing is quite general. It could cover what's called tarnet and CFRnet and Dragonet, a lot of kind of deep learning models for Kate. And we can actually even make it more general than this, but I don't want to go into that. Okay, so we have this just model, Bayesian model for the two potential outcomes, y1 and y0. This all should should be conditioned on X. Just very, I'm very sad that it's not here. Anyway, K is basically the first moment. It's, in a, it's a conditional expectation. To look at statistical uncertainty, we will look at the second moment, so the conditional variance. So again, I'm, I apologize. This would be the variance of y1 minus y0, conditional on x. And we look at the variance of, of this quantity over the distribution of omega0, omega1, y0, y1. So the weights of the network and the potential outcomes all together condition on the data set. So this is the posterior. 
And we could just use the law of total variance and show that this uh, conditional variance can be decomposed into the sum of two terms. The first is the expectation of the variance of the difference condition on uh, the expected means. And the second is the variance of the difference of, of these expected means, mu, mu omega 1 and mu omega 0. This second term is what is known as the epi epistemic uncertainty in k. It's the variance of the k hat estimate. And we can, we can actually estimate this term. The first term, the term in purple, is what is known as the aleatoric uncertainty. It's the irreducible uncertainty. It's like the, the, the sigma squared that we cannot do anything about. And this is actually invariant to the Kate estimate itself. So in this work, we do not actually estimate it. We don't deal with it. We just have some upper bound for it, and we leave this to future work. So we focus on this uh, red term, the epistemic uncertainty, which is, again, the variance in our Kate hat estimate. And the variance here comes from the distribution of omega 0 and omega 1, so the distribution of the weights of the neural network. So we have many different models estimating Kate, and they might disagree with each other, and this give us, gives us a measure of this variance. More technically, we estimate this using a, 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 an approach called MC dropout, developed by Irene Gall and Zubin Garamani, basically using dropout, which is a common technique in, in deep learning, but using it both during train and test time. And it works for a bunch of, of, of deep, deep network models for estimating K. We also extended this to a model called CIVE, which is a conditional, which is a, a variation all encoder approach. This, is, this requires a bit more work, and I, I won't go into how we did uh, that. OK, we, we estimate this, this variance. How does this behave? Like, what happens here? And again, we estimate it using dropout test time. This is the MC dropout method, which was developed just for ordinary neural networks, irrespective of K. We adapt this to the K set. So how should it work? So let's look at this uh, very simplified example. So let's say we have two populations, the T equals 1, the people who receive the one treatment versus the other, the T equals 0 on the bottom. And we have a single covariate, X. And these circles are the train data. So as you see, we have lots of train data between minus 3 and 3. And we have these two functions, the y1 function and y0 function, which have this weird uh, shape just because that's how we make it. Between x is equals minus 3 and 3, we have lots of training data. So we have an easy time estimating the models. However, beyond x equals 3 in this shaded blue area, we have no data. So we should express a lot of uncertainty. A good uncertainty model should say, oh, I have no idea what's going on here because I haven't seen any data from this set, from this area of axis. So in the red box, we have great overlap. We have great support, but only there. This is one thing we would want to see happen. We want to see that we have low uncertainty between minus 3 and 3 and high uncertainty beyond 3. Now let's complicate this a bit. So now we've changed the distribution. Now we have the following. X is greater than 4. Again, we have no data whatsoever. But for in the red boxes, we have data, but only from one treatment arm. So between 2 and 4, we only have data from people who receive t equals 1. And between minus 3 and minus 2, only people who receive t equals 0. And so in these two red boxes, we have a violation of overlap. We have only one-sided distributions. People only receive one or the other treatments. So again, a good uncertainty, Kate uncertainty model should say, oh, in these red boxes, we can't really estimate Kate because we only have data for one of the treatments and not the other. So we have no way to estimate the counterfactuals. And what we see here is real uh, neural nets fit to this data and how they behave. So we fit many, the MC dropout uh, uh, trick is you fit, you have many different uh, outcomes, uh, which is equivalent to fitting many models. And as you see, the pink model for estimating under the t equals 1 population starts going crazy where there's no data because it can, many different models all fit the data equally well. And the same for the green data, for the green models for t equals 0. And if we kind of uh, merge everything into uh, uncertainty measures uh, using basically just a standard deviation, we see in black that on the right, beyond the 4, we have very high uncertainty because we have no data from either t equals 0 or t equals 1. But in the area between t 2 and 4, we have also pretty high uncertainty because we don't have one of the treatments, and the same between minus 3 and, and minus 2. So in this toy example, we'd see that this uh, MC dropout approach, uh, estimating epistemic uncertainty, gives us the right results. It, it shows that we are uncertain where we should be uncertain. 
okay, for measured values, values L of distribution and for measured values where overlap is not satisfied. This is the statistical uncertainty. So it captures a covariate shift. So if we have X's out of the train distribution and it covers overlap violations and also near, like here we, it's of course, it's a toy example, it's an extreme case, but also near violence. And these are all the statistical uncertainties, but this is all un under the assumption that we have measured all the confounds. So before I move to the next step, are there any questions about this set? So or there is a question from Andrew Halim. I'm going to show it. Do you see it on your screen? The effect on X on the world population may be con considered a effect on X. Or 80. I guess it's more of a comment uh, than, a, than a question. Yeah, so you can condition on, right, Kate. The problem with Kate, I, it's not a great terminology because conditional average treatment effect can be Condition on being over 80, which is a huge population. It could be conditioned on X being like the vector representing like all the medical record of a patient, which is exactly one person. So Kate is the too large a term, which is why I sometimes talk about patient level effects or individual level effects uh, to differentiate between the two. For simplicity, the examples I gave of overlap violations are really like everyone over 80 is, is such and such. And in fact, overlap violations become become actually nastier the, the higher the dimension of X. And there's actually a very nice paper from uh, Alex Damore et al. about this phenomenon. Yep, which is what I think uh, Dennis here is, is saying. Uh, you might have overlap violations easily. And again, that, that's exactly the motivation for, for this work. Because if X is not really relevant, the epistemic uncertainty will not be so high because it's not really used to estimate why. In our experience, I'm not sure I'll have time to go into all the details. We actually show this, that uh, you could do better by thinking about epistemic uncertainty because it takes into account what Xs are actually useful for Y and not just looking at, for example, the propensities. This was a statistical uncertainty. And this was, in a sense, an easier problem because we could take tools of uncertainty used to just model outcome uncertainty and apply them here, taking into account that you have this difference of two things and you have and that you have more than one failure mode. You have this overlap failure mode and the L distribution failure mode, which again here are illustrated like as, as like hard like breaks, but obviously there it's kind of smoother transition. I have bad overlap, weak overlap, or, or like almost out of distribution, and you want your search to reflect that. And again, in the experiments, we show that in high dimensional data, but this was just for illustration purposes. But anyway, here we could use existing tools uh, more easily. But now I want to go into maybe a harder problem, which is what I call causal uncertainty, which is what happens, what do you do about hidden confound, right? Like, how do you quantify this unknown unknown? And this was in, in a follow-up paper, which was in ICML uh, this year. So how can we account for the uncertainty due to the possible presence of hidden confound? And, and this is closely related to quantifying the uncertainty and how well specified our model is. Our assumption now will be that we have some violation of this conditional ignorability. And how do we quantify what is left out? So we're not the first to ask this question. And, and generally, the approach is a type of sensitivity analysis, which the gist is usually the fault. You say, OK, we might have hidden confounded. We might have some Xs or some, as we call them, Us, which affect the treatment and the outcome and are unmeasured. But they can't be too important, right? If they're if they're super powerful and I have no measuring, no measurement of them, I kind of I'm out of luck. I have not not nothing much to do. But that's a worst case scenario. So the, usually the approach is to say, okay, let's assume there's hidden confounding, but it's not bigger than some quantity. And then we have not one model, but some range of possible models. And we say, okay, the causal effect could be between this and that, assuming a bounded level of hidden confounding, because we know that we have unbounded hidden confounding. All bits are off. There's nothing. So this was started by a paper in, wrote by, from Rosenbaum and Rubin in 1983 and many, many others following. Almost all of them, all of these literature is about estimating the average treatment effect. So the one scalar, which is the, the treatment effect over the entire population combined. There is a bit of work on sensitivity analysis for Kate. And again, when I say Kate here, I mean high dimensional Kate, where X is some high dimensional effect. So there's a very nice work from, from Steve Yadlovsky et al. And there's work from Nathan Callis and Xiao J. Mao and Angela Joe from AI Stats 2019, which is the basis for our work. So this Callis et al. paper was our starting point. 
they based their idea, their sensitivity analysis on, on something called the marginal sensitivity, sensitivity model, which I'll explain now, which was introduced by Tan in, 20, in 2006. In this model, we differentiate between two propensity scores. There's the nominal propensity score, ET of X, which is just how we would usually estimate the propensity score, probability of treatment condition on X. Okay, so this models you know, the doctor process, right? How will this patient receive treatment one or zero based on their COVID. And then there's the complete propensity score, which is the same, but now we condition actually on the value of the potential outcome, ET of X, Y. It's not hard to show that assuming the assumption of no hidden confounding is like saying that these two are actually uh, the same, that you don't need to know Y, you only need to know X to estimate the probability of truth. We're going to, we're going to do away with this assumption, so we'll somehow have to bound how far away these two quantities are. The nominal propensity score, which we can estimate from data, and the complete propensity score, which we in general cannot estimate from data. So we'll have to bound their difference. And the MSN says the following. Let's say that the uh, ratio of odds ratios of these two things, re recall ET, both are between 0 and 1. Both are probability of a binary a variable, so they're between 0 and 1. So the assumption is that the ratio of the odds ratio is bounded between some gamma and, and 1 over gamma, where gamma is greater or equal to 1. Okay, So under the MSM, saying gamma equals 1 is saying, I assume there's no hidden confounding. But in general, if I say gamma is equal to 2, it's saying, OK, I'm allowing some level of hidden confounding, which is reflected in the fact that the true probability of treatment assignment is greater or smaller than the one I naively estimate from the data by assuming I've seen everything. So I'm allowing the propensity scores to vary, the true propensity scores to vary from the nominal ones, but only by gamma through this odds ratio formulation, which is just mathematically convenient. Okay, so this is the MSM model from, from TAM. How do we use this to derive these intervals for K? So we want to get, say, okay, let's get, let's assume gamma equals two. So I'm allowing this level of hand confounding. Now I'll get a range of kates, uh, which is all the plausible kates under all the possible kates under this level of hidden confounding. And we'll, we'll define this set of functions. And we'll just use this color coding for non identifiable, qu identifiable quantities in orange and identifiable quality quantities in blue. So what can be estimated and cannot be estimated from data. Okay, and now. For this part, I'm ignoring finite sample. We'll put this back later. So assuming we have enough data, we can estimate the blue quantity. So we'll start with WT of Y given X, which is the true inverse propensity score. So people familiar with causal inference will recognize that inverse propensity score is widely used. This is the, the inverse of the true propensity score, so it's non-identified. We'll have mu of X T, which is the expectation of Y condition on X and T. This is the observed conditional expected outcome. This is a uh, Observe it. so this is uh, identifiable, and f of y a condition on x and t is similar to mu, but this is now the density uh, and not just the uh, uh, the expectation. Uh, so again, but this is observed quantity. So I, I see x t and y. I can estimate the density of y given x and t. Y is a, is a scalar or or a binary. If if my outcomes are binary, it's just binary. We'll define this set. W, which is basically the set of inverse of true inverse propensity weights, which are within this gamma interval. So this this is defined by uh, the two bounds of the interval alpha and beta. And alpha and beta themselves are identifiable quantities. They're just rescaling of the observed propensity score, of the naively estimated propensity score using this gamma. So I have this interval between alpha and beta, which is which is a function of x and gamma. And now I define the set of weights which lie within this interval. So the edges of the interval are identified. And I'll just define this kappa, which we'll need later, which is just the ratio of alpha to beta minus alpha. Okay, so this W uh, is the set of possible true propensity scores within gamma of the nominal propensity. Again, the scaling is because of this odds ratio thing, and it's, it's much more convenient mathematically. Now, how do we find a k-interval? So we'll define this residual between the uh, expected outcome y and the true y. We'll define this function mu of wt and xt, which is, uh, this is similar to the doubly robust score for those familiar. So we have this identifiable mu plus the integral of the residual weighted by uh, the inverse, the true inverse propensity score 
and the density, the true density of, uh, not the expected density of, the observed density of y given x and t, and normalized by this integral. So we have this normalization constant. We can show that th this is an expectation, the, the true potential outcome uh, distribution, but we cannot estimate this because we have this true inverse propensity score, which we don't have. Now we'll define these two, the bounds, the upper and lower bounds. So we'll say, okay, let's look at the supermoon of this mu wt over all the possible weighting functions, which are within gamma of the nominal propensity score. We'll do the same for the supermoon and infimum. And then we can take the upper bound minus the lower bound because k is a difference and the lower bound minus the upper bound. Taking all these, we end up with this interval. Okay, we end up with the interval of uh, k values that correspond to all the true propensity scores, possible true propensity scores, which are up to gamma away from the nominal propensity score. So this is the interval we would like to estimate. This is the interval of possible k functions which are consistent with the true propensity score being gamma far away from the nominal propensity score. And the problem is we need to solve this optimization problem over this over the weights because we do not know the weight. So the challenge is how to solve this optimization problem. Once we solve this, we plug it in the, these tau's and we get this interval. Okay, so we've reduced the problem to the problem of of solving this using uh, ideas from Callus. We can actually uh, transform this uh, uh, to this problem. The problem, the optimization problem, is supermoon over values of y of this sum of two things, the mu xt, which again is identifiable, and this integral now going from y star to infinity of the residual times the density divided by something kappa is, a, is some combination of alpha and beta. Okay, so the, this is where the magic happens. Okay, this, if you remember this comics of, you know, doing math and then put three points and say, oh, now I proved it because that's where the magic happens. This is here. And all the details are deep in the appendix of our paper. Okay, but ne because now we move to everything is identifiable. Okay, kappa is identifiable, conditional density is identifiable. We can do this. And even now, solving this optimization problem is not trivial, uh, but at least it's it's all over observable quantities. So I can do this. What we need here is way is to estimate all these quantities. So this is not too hard. F is a conditional density. We model it with deep conditional Gaussian mixture models because Gaussian mixture models are universal approximators. Remember, this is a conditional density of a scalar, and we just learned the mixture weights means the variances with deep Bayesian neural networks. Uh, mu hat is just the the mean of, of these f hats. This is the density. This is, this is the expectation. The kappa, if you dig deep enough, is just a, a, a simple uh, reparameterization of the nominal propensity score, which again we can estimate using. Any method for estimating propensity scores, we use a Bayesian neural net uh, again. And so we can estimate basically all of these from training data because these are, are identifiable quantities. And at test time, we still need to work a bit, but I'll kind of skip that. The, the, the procedure is as follows. We, we estimate the conditional density of the propensity score from data. We do some uh, optimization, which is O of m log m for m Monte Carlo samples from the density. This gives us a solution to this, which we can prove. Again, it's not trivial. I'm, I'm skipping over the nastier uh, math. Uh, but the bottom line is we can do this. We can estimate these functions and estimate these lower and, 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 uh, and upper bounds for the Kate function. Okay, so this gives us our Kate interval estimator uh, once we do all, all of this uh, work. And this is a gives us a little uncertainty for gamma level of hidden confounding. Okay, so uh, we're allowing some hidden confounding and still estimating k using a flexible model. Okay, These are neural nets. They're flexible. They scale well to high dimensional data. And we can tweak them and play with them uh, as we wish, as we do with ordinary uh, neural nets. And the computational complexity is, is not basically just estimating these models and just a tiny bit more uh, for the MC samples. And we can actually show that if our outcome density model and propensity model are consistent for bounded y, we converge in probability uh, to the true uh, gamma interval. This in theory should work. As we all know, though, these are neural nets, so it doesn't mean that actually, but our experiments are, are, have decent results. Now, the only thing we need to add to this is adding the statistical uncertainty because we, we still have that, right? We might have mistakes in our conditional density models, in our propensity models, just because we have finite samples, 
have overlap violations, everything else. So we can do the same, the same idea. We take the same idea of taking expectation over these neural nets using the same AMC dropout idea and just add, let's say, twice square root of this variance, which we can estimate in a similar way to what we've seen earlier, add it all together. So now we have this interval, but the edges of the interval are themselves uncertain. So we add uh, this uncertainty as well. And we get like this combined interval, which combines statistical and causal uncertainty. And we just say we are only partially happy with how we combine these two. And we're trying to think about somewhat more principled way for this combination. Bringing it all together, we have all these uncertainties. So let's, again, this is a toy example just for illustration purpose. Let's say we have X is measured between minus two and two. On the left, we get to see more of the blues, which are T equals zero. So we have more of the T equals zero on the left, more a population of T equals one on the right. We also have hidden confound. So the dashed line is the true Kate function. But because we have hidden confounding, we cannot estimate it in an unbiased way. So the blue line here is if we just estimated Kate naively, saying, assuming there's no hidden confounding, but this assumption is wrong. So we have a biased model. This is the difference. What you see here in, in pink is just the statistical uncertainty for now. Okay. So as you see, it starts getting bigger near the edge of the minus two to two range because overlap starts breaking down near the edge. And then it goes completely wide because we have no data here. So the, the statistical uncertainty kind of uh, is all over the place as it should be, right? We have no data from here. We've never seen patients with X equals three. So we have no idea what their K should be. But now we're going to add to this the uh, causal uncertainty. So now the pink will grow as we grow our gamma. So we'll see now, this is, we'll see log gamma now. So low gamma zero means no hidden, assuming no hidden confounding. This is going to grow and we'll see how the pink uh, go, goes wider until it actually covers the dashed line at the pre-specified level. Now we're seeing gamma going wider and uh, going higher and the, the, our uncertainty uh, correspondingly uh, is higher. And of course, what level of gamma is somewhat similar to asking like, do we want like 95% confident in interval or 90% confident in confidence interval? Except now gamma is kind of units of hidden confounding. It specifies how far away can the true propensity score be from the nominal propensity score? Before I go to the experiments, any questions about this? So the, there are a bunch of questions, some are specific, some are more general. Would you like to take them now or, because we, we don't have that much more time okay, left, so or, or do we, do, do you want to wait till the end? I'll, I'll go over quickly over the experiments. There's not much and okay. then we can take them. Off. Sounds good. First, we talk about, we experiment only with statistical uncertainty. And we take the IHCP data set, which is a widely used semi-synthetic causal inference benchmark, and we induce covariance check. We remove instances with marital status equals unmarried from the training set, but not from the test set. So distributions now are somewhat different. This is 25 dimensional data. And now we're saying our experiment is let's reject points. Let's defer or reject, say, okay, I'm not sure about this, so I'm not going to make any recommendation. And what the behavior we want to see is that the more we reject, the less errors we make. We should reject the places where we end up making an error. And what we see on the left is, the green line is, is our method, which knows which points to reject. All the other lines are rejecting, rejecting either randomly or by extreme propensity scores. So if you have high propensity, really high or really low, have two variations on that, should reject. And you see that in IFCP, rejecting by propensity score is basically useless. It's as, it's as good as random, but rejecting by our method is much better. You reject points which reduce your errors. Uh, when we have covariate shift, the propensity score does begin to be uh, useful, but still not as useful as rejecting by epistemic uncertainty. And now for the causal uncertainty, now we take the same IFP data set, but we completely remove uh, that, that covariate. So it's not there. So it does matter for treatment and outcomes. So we have hidden confounding. And again, we do the same, but now we compare four methods. So we take only statistical uncertainty, which is this blue line. We take only causal uncertainty, which is this green, solid green line. And you take both, which is the pink line. So we see here that basically causal uncertainty is what matters. It dominates and it allows us to get uh, to 
very small error rates, we, we know which points to defer. Uh, the dashed line is the method from, from Cal's et al. Uh, from 2019, which doesn't do very well. The, the problem with that method is it, it scales pretty poorly to high or even medium dimensional data, which was part of the motivation uh, for our work. So just to summarize, if you want to use individual level causal inference for high stakes recommendations, should be safe. That means that we need to take uncertainties uh, seriously and communicate it and possibly withhold recommendations. And individual level causal inference sources of uncertainty relate to classic statistical and causal sum. All the sources of uncertainty are related to some degree of violation of assuming test and trade distribution are the same, assuming we have overlap, each unit can get either treatment, assuming there's no hidden confounding. When these are violated or, or close to violated, we have higher uncertainty and, and we should reflect that. And we give methods to evaluate uncertainty stemming from all these sources. And I didn't have much time to go into this, but we show that they work well on high dimensional data, which is, is our focus. Now, just some open questions is, is like, I'll just give a few. So how do you validate these kind of certainty estimate and models? Uh, we ran some experiments, but this is uh, far from enough. How do you, we codify all this uncertainty in one common language. So we had these Bayesian things and the gamma thing, and they're they're not exactly commensurate. So commensurate. So how do we how do we bring them all together? How do we interface this with humans? So we we talked a lot about deferring, but maybe there are other ways to interface with humans instead of deferring. Saying we're how do you do that? Uh, uh, profit like in a, in a good way. How do you deal with continuous treatments? How do you deal with survival outcomes, which have their own kind of set of problems when you're doing causal inference with survival outcomes, which are very common in healthcare? So these are all some open questions. We have uh, have many more. I just want to thank again my co-authors, uh, Andrew, Soren, and Yurin. And thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. And I'm happy to take any questions now. Great. Or well, thank you so much. This is an awesome talk. I think you inspired me to read your paper more carefully now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm glad. You I want to read it. the appendix? You want to get into the math? I, I, I don't know. We'll see. Let me get through the main part. I, I mean, the math is all doable. It's just not very presentation friendly. Let's yeah, I understood. Of course. Yeah. No, this is this is awesome. I lo love the emphasis on, on safety. I love the idea of not making a recommendation when it's not warranted. I think we should all think about that. Uh, certainly important in, in healthcare. Okay, we've got a few questions here uh, uh, lined up, so I'm going to try to do the same. I'm going to share them, and hopefully you can see them on the screen. Uh, the first one is from Srinath uh, Madathil. What are your thoughts uh, on the impact of informative priors and weights of neural nets on the uncertainty levels on K? I don't even—is there such thing as informative priors on weights of, on, of the neural nets? I'm I'm not exactly sure what the question asker has in mind, but you, you could have. Like you have structure in your neural net, right? If, if, for example, some of your data comes from imaging and some from these like tabular things, you might, your neural net won't just ingest all of them. We might have some structure and you might put some smart priors on that. They should, to a degree, they should just lower your uncertainty in a good way, right? Your epistemic uncertainty should be lower if your model is better. And if your priors are good, your model should be better. You should have lower uncertainty. It, is there a smarter way to combine the, the, the these ideas? Possibly. I, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Okay. Let me bring up the next one from Vladimir Feinberg. Uh, so I think more of a fundamental question here. As a patient who needs to make a decision about which of the two treatments I prefer, why would I care about Kate versus a quantile approach? Right. Any thoughts on, on this that's, question? That's an excellent point. And often... Kate was our go-to as kind of what we're used to in, in our community, but it's true that often that's actually not what, what's more, most useful. These neural nets that estimate the conditional density could easily be adapted to quantiles, and you could actually tailor your loss function to get, if you, if you know which quantile you care about a priori, you could actually tailor your loss function to that. I'm, I'm not familiar with the pinball loss. Uh, so I'll have to read up about about that, but I know there's kind of quantum regression losses. Yeah, that's that's a very important point and and something we we are actually thinking about in the context of survival outcomes, like com combining the two. Because in survival outcomes, you might have like on average, your patient gets like two more months, and you're saying maybe that doesn't matter much, but I care about the ten percent who might get like five more years, and let's optimize for that. 
And so that, that's a great point and, and still work in pro progress. Oh, okay, very well. Next one uh, from Fred Gruber. It is a customary question about how much data would you need? What, what's your sense and, you know, approximately uh, on the data size? It's really hard to say, right? Because like, it's not just mm -hmm. how much data, it's like what data, right? Yeah. These things often work well with thousands of samples. That's, I feel bad even saying that because it's, it depends so much on which samples, right? Like it's, but uh, I'll put it differently. If you have dozens of samples, you might not want to go with the neural net. You might just go with like Bayesian linear regression, right? Which is, some might argue a, a neural net, just a simple one. And some people here are kind of pulling their ha hair out that I just said this, but everything- It's said, okay. And, no yeah, and, but this could all be used with Bayesian, like Bayesian linear regression. And actually one thing we're working on is adapting our method to any, for the causal method, you just need a conditional density model and propensity model with like with uncertainties. It doesn't really matter if they come from a neural net. Yeah, yeah come sure. any model. So this is not a paper where we're working on code that will actually just enable you to plug in whatever conditional density and, and propensity score models you have and use them. So neural nets are not crucial, They're definitely not for the second part. Uh, I, can, I can imagine you can do some guessing process Definitely. Uh, as well. It's just that it would be really hard to fit a, a large guessing process model. It would be yeah. uh, uh, faster and possible to fit it in the neural nets. Okay, let me go to the next question from, this one is for, from, uh, I think I should say Jörg Stoya, but I, sorry if I, if I messed that up. And I think his question was like when uh, in on that slide where he showed a variance estimation is asking, you know, you're doing two standard yeah. deviations around and so on. So what, what's your what's your yeah. take on it? Yeah, my take on, on it is that, as I said, we're not completely happy about the way we combine these two. So we do two, you could do kind of alpha standard deviations and just set alpha whatever you want. We're not calling it a 95% interval exactly for that reason, because it's not obvious that a normal approximation, it sometimes makes sense, but yeah. not always, because these are kind of edges of intervals, so it's, it's not obvious. And that's actually something we're trying to think about how to do this uh, more rigorously. Got it, okay. So the next question comes from our friend, Dan Simpson from Australia, who told me this is 3 a.m. He, he must be a real <laughs> fan, because like, I, I mean, I have no oh idea. My God. You must really <laughs> like this topic. So go, go, Dan. So his question, uh, is there a way to construct a cross-validation scheme or something to evaluate both uncertainties, like a proper scoring rule, interval score to evaluate this? I think for the statistical uncertainty, you should be able to do this. And I think actually the, uh, Yareen has been, has work on that. Like I, I'll have to defer to Yareen because that's, that's really his expertise. The second one is, is, is tough because you don't know kind of, it's these unknown unknowns. So we, we could always run simulations where we inject a specified level of head confounding and see that it matches. And we actually did that, but that's mm. super specific. Like it's always like simulation dependent, right? Even if you have your data, you're simulating this hidden confounding part. For the first part, I would say yes. For the second part, I would say we have no idea. And, and it's a tough question. All right, I'll ask the last question and then, then we have to go. And that is, you know, do, do you know of, of uh, anybody who's trying to use it in kind of re uh, real-time settings or is there, you know, some brave clinicians that, that, that decided to maybe try to, to look at these recommendations? Uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts uh, on that? We've been working for a while with physicians from our university hospital on, on such a model. We are not yet ready to deploy. So we are now actually estimating all these uncertainties on data. Deploying is still a whole uh, different ball game. We, we do intend to get there. We actually have funding for all the setup, but we're still not there. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Uri. This was great. Really appreciate you doing it. Uh, I think we got a lot of value out of it. For the rest of you who hung around this late, thank you for tuning in. And we'll see you guys again uh, in October. All the best. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eric, for hosting me. And thanks for the great questions. You got a lot of good ones. Excellent. Thank you.